Well, I'm so I'm so happy to be joined by you tonight. Um, really, like this product was born from my intense desire as a clinician. So I'm a primary care nurse practitioner, and I was also going after the role of scientist to really change the protocol that other clinicians follow. Because similar to what you're saying, we're so limited on a day-to-day -day basis based on the research that has already been done. And unfortunately, we're really behind when it comes to research that reaches women and children. And so I, I will just go ahead and, and share a little bit about my journey. My passion is really how do we create the most preventative modalities and make them accessible to the underserved? And this really stemmed personally from growing up with poor access to healthcare in the United States. Um, there's plenty of other places in the world that have very, very limited access to resources. And so uh, I wanted to figure out, okay, what is nature designed to really keep us healthy and optimal as a species? And how do we continue to optimize that without the reliance of outside industry players dictating if we have access to medications or not. And my fascination really um, began with the, the immunobiology of breast milk. So I was studying under one of the greatest microbiome researchers, actually. Her name is Dr. Maureen Grower. And we had a very rich data set. It was longitudinal data from preterm birth all the way till four years of age. And we were really able with this population that's new to the world to have a clean slate to observe correlation. And what I mean by that is it's difficult in an adult who has comorbidities or um, you know other illnesses or drugs that they're taking that may actually alter the intestinal flora specifically. But in a newborn baby, we really get a clear picture of the type of microbes that are in their gut and as well as the extrinsic factors that are shaping that development. And we also measured over four years the health outcomes. So it was, it was very much art. If you're into art and science, you could see very clearly, I was looking at maternal inflammatory cytokines that were being produced in the breast milk. So that mean that gave me a snapshot of women and understanding their um, sociodemographics. Were they single? Were they under financial duress? How much did that actually impact and change the quality of their breast milk to have more pro-inflammatory proteins that are actually um, titrated based on the baby's saliva and the cross milk, the crosstalk through those milk ducts. It changes the demand of the type of immune protein that the baby receives, as well as um, it's like a tailored cocktail because as you know, babies don't have T cells until two years of age. So it's their natural defense. But beyond that, I was really curious about mechanism of how this gut microbiome that we live with really, like we're only 10% human DNA and we're 90% we're microbial DNA. And I was like, how do we really optimize the microbiome development because that honestly influences after three years of life, really the way we eat, think, function, metabolize food, our predisposition to inflammatory conditions and illnesses later on in life. And the starting at the beginning with this fresh slate, and this is the most vulnerable of the population, the preterm infants, I was curious in solving one problem initially. And it was, how do we prevent these babies from dying because of an imbalance of their gut microbiome? So what we were finding is that the dysbiosis or the imbalance of the gut bacteria in the preterm infants was leading to necrotizing enterocolitis as well as sepsis. And 
there are seven determinants of microbiome development. You know, unfortunately, at the very beginning, we can't always control the delivery method. So whether you have an emergent cesarean or whether you have a vaginal birth, nature shows us vaginal gives us the beneficial bacteria to already start colonizing and laying down the beneficial real estate, essentially, in the baby's gut to help bolster their defenses against the outside world and viruses in the outside world. Unfortunately, can't always control that. So moving on to gestational age is another determinant of epigenetic optimization. And what I mean by that is <clears throat> the formation of the microbiome is such a unique point in time because it really, with this 90% microbes that make us us, we can influence how we turn off and on our human genetic switches. And I was really focused on how do we get the best and the beneficial microbes populating our flora to optimize our epigenetics and our development in life. And when we get to gestational age, as you definitely know through your clinical work, Sometimes you're going to have, you know, a pre premature rupture of the membranes and the less time that the baby has spent in utero, the more susceptible they are and the less positive colonization they have had through the placenta with beneficial microbes. So they're vulnerable, but again, it's one thing we can't completely control. The fourth or the third is actually... Um, this mode of delivery. So um, we repeated this one, but actually we do know that we can smear the baby if they were delivered um, cesarean with the vaginal fluids to actually populate some of that beneficial bacteria. The other determinant is antibiotic use. But again, if you had to have a premature um, delivery, or you had an infection at birth, you can't always control if you needed to take antibiotics or not. And um, unfortunately, oh, yes, go ahead. You have, um, you have freedom to speak. Oh, okay. Yes. So I, I want to take you back to uh, mode of delivery. So if I, I heard you well, you said that um, baby, who are born through cesarean section, they can be smeared with vaginal uh, fluid or discharge. Did I hear you say that? Yes. So, so how do you do that? I will send you the article. Um, actually, I can include it in this slide deck when we get off the call because there's a protocol that okay. hospitals have been adopting in the U.S., so for the babies that have uh -huh. an emergent cesarean, they really just get in, get in there with a swab or even I think a, a gloved hand and are, are providing uh -huh. that with as much of the vaginal secretion as if they had just gone through the birth canal. And, and that is exposing uh -huh. to the beneficial flora that is actually in the vaginal canal. And as I like to explain this early colonization of the infant microbiome as real estate. So it's like who has the first opportunity to get in is most likely to thrive. So if you're in a brand new city and you have brand new buildings going up, you know, that property developer is likely to stay for a long time. It's very difficult to basically switch over the type of bacteria. So that's why early exposure to um, not gram negative pathogenic bacteria is so important. Um, the, the other feature, and like, this is the most in interesting thing for me, because when we got to feeding, it was finally, it was finally what we can actually control for. And can you still, still see my screen? I think so. Um, yes, I can see your screen. 
finally, when we got to feeding, it was like this aha moment. Okay. So the most, the most, um, corrective measure as clinicians that we could take to positively impact the epigenetic expression and gut microbiome of these babies and prevent sepsis and necrotizing enterocolitis and fatalities was giving that baby breast milk for longer. And so I'm going to come back to that point, but that's for me, that was like a light bulb going off. Cause I'm like, we can do something about this. This is something that we have the opportunity to give babies either donor milk for longer or help the moms continue breastfeeding for as long as possible. I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, the other determinants that were interesting were environmental exposures. So there were findings in the literature of basically these neonatal units that have um, bacteria that are resistant to antibiotics that are growing. And when they swabbed basically um, the, the computers and the surfaces in the NICU, they found that these strains of antibiotic resistant bacteria actually were early colonizers of those babies' guts. And, and they found in twins as well that genetics actually plays far less of a role in twins and in multiple studies in terms of the type of bacteria that are present and environment actually played much more of a of a determining role and so after understanding the determinants of microbiome development i really got hyper focused on okay what are the barriers to breastfeeding? What is keeping clinicians in your setting or moms when they go home from the hospital from really being able to deliver breast milk for longer? And so that's when I got my first grant with the National Science Foundation in the United States. And they gave me funding just to basically go look and survey open-ended out of hundreds of interviews across North America. And then I did my own research in Nepal where they actually have the best breastfeeding rates in the world to six months and to two years, according to the World Health Organization's recommendation. And consistently, nursing moms face this challenge with breastfeeding after introducing a standard bottle. They kept describing this latching frustration. And so when we dug into it a little bit deeper, they were saying it's the shape, the feel, and the flow is just not like my breast. My baby either gets used to the breast or the bottle and gets fussy when trying to switch between both. And so you can see how there was other factors that did show up here in terms of support, as well as actual medical concerns such as mastitis. But another thing that concerned us was we listened to all of these barriers and prioritized basically the challenges that were necessary to solve supporting families in their and helping them in their feeding journey. And the medical concerns related to latching frustration included nipple pain, latch of, lack of education on how to latch, as well as equipment for pumping not feeding properly. So from these gaps in industry actually came our product and service roadmap of solutions that we call by nurture. So I'm really excited just to welcome you. Uh, I want I felt it was important to explain the research that has been done since 2017 to really get here and, and have a transformational product. But we're really focusing now on empowering clinical leaders to transform healthcare through research through innovation, so you can actually optimize delivery of care. And um, I'll just give you a moment to ask any questions. If you have any, I'm going to go ahead and refill my water really quick before moving on. Uh, okay, so earlier on, uh, on your first slide, you showed on, uh, I'm not sure what point it was, it is, but on feeding. So I'm just interested to know uh, um, how the natural nipple plays a role in feeding preterm babies, especially within uh, six weeks of birth. 
especially because um so in the country the practice is that uh preterm babies who are below of course um there's a they are a preterm baby and with a birth weight i would say of um less than 1.8 they are admitted in the neonatal unit so what happens is low they are fed using a a nasogastric tube but then as they grow and gain weight of course uh we promote or we advise the woman to to express so that they feed on their mother's milk that is the breast milk um however as they grow and they reach to a certain weight i would say uh to up to 1.8 well some they then start to feed using the uh using a cup yeah so i'm just interested in how uh babies are fed in in the us or and especially with in relation to the nipple to the natural nipple how it plays a role in that yeah that's an excellent question bungle so um what from this research uh we ended up doing was basically patenting the first product that actually I went around and I 3D scanned women when they were actively lactating to make the shape as close to breast as possible. So what happens if you're ordering <clears throat> as a consumer is you actually get latch matched to the shape that is closest to your breast. But the most important thing was that by in, in mimicking shape, the patent actually allowed us to more accurately model the microfluidics of breastfeeding. And so it was actually another scientist that had, I saw this when I was in my PhD. And after six months of listening to what women were struggling with, I was absolutely shocked. So she had looked at every existing bottle on the market. So that's what you see here. And this is flow rate in terms of milliliters per minute. And this is Dr. Britt Pados's work. You can see the average from current bottles is five to 85 milliliters a minute. And what we did know at the time from Dr. Geddes, Donna Geddes in Australia, was that preterm infants need milk on average at 2.2 milliliters or less, minute or less. And so this was what got me to go create something because I realized, oh my God, no one even studied lactation uh, beyond the preterm setting or accurately made it um, replicated in a infant feeding system, right? Like the, the way the milk passes through the nipple. And the, re the work that we were doing for the last two years in the National Science Foundation phase one study specifically looked at feeding related events only re associated with current bottles. So these weren't babies that were breastfeeding. These were babies that the only thing going through their mouth was the fluid from a bottle. And what we quantified that was just published in advances of neonatal care, a top tier medical journal, is that this is doubling the length of stay and the consult cost because it's essentially choking infants. They were having more bradycardia, hypoxia. Um, there were even some fatalities in the study. And to get the hospital to pay attention to this problem, we also looked at cost. So in the US, we have a different billing system, but insurance usually gets reimbursed. Uh, like some of these costs usually get reimbursed from the hospital by insurance. And specifically, this problem from current bottles was costing the hospital one hundred and fifty four thousand per baby, and one hundred and thirty two thousand of that is not reimbursable. So by getting the decision maker to pay attention and say, "Look, this isn't only costing the the health of the next generation." but this is also making you lose money. We were able to basically successfully get them to transfer over to our safer 
feeding system. So I'll just show you the new standard basically of care that we're demonstrating. So this is showing how fast competitors flow on average, and we have a guaranteed under 2.2 milliliters a minute for preterm infants. And then from, from preterm onward, we have data-driven milk flows from every stage of baby's development the, throughout the first year to biomimic breastfeeding. So um, the phase two study that we're looking at right now, that was non-inferiority. That was just looking at the hospital, um, seeing what current bottles were costing them. We already have the data from NSF from our third party flow testing to show them, okay, this is a flow related issue in existing products. Here's how we are guaranteed to flow. You can look at our, our research that was done with NSF. And the phase two study now is giving hospitals in the United States the opportunity to say, okay, and when you switch over to us, let's see how much it saves you in terms of the baby's health, reducing bradycardia, hypoxia, apnea, corresponding to choking, colic, and reflux, as well as how much money do we save you. So for the mothers themselves, this is really at a functional level, they are empowered once they are leaving the hospital that they have 83% reduction in this latching time, right? So when the baby is getting confused between switching between breast and bottle, we've mitigated that compared to other bottles by 83%. So there are seamless transitions if you need to give donor milk um, or if you need to pump your milk and you need to safely feed your baby. Go ahead. I, I think you're, are you raising your hand now? Yes. Uh, so my, uh, another question is that, um, so when were, were the preterm babies enrolled? Does it mean were, were they enrolled as soon as they were born? Meaning that is when they were newborns, like uh, I would say one day old or zero day old, or, and also, for how long were they followed yeah. under the study? Excellent question. So these babies, um, I'm going to, the article is also hyperlinked here in terms of like the inclusion criteria. So this was retrospective. They were, we were looking at feeding related events the entire time that they were admitted to the hospital. And so there was 308 infants between 32 and 44 weeks of gestational age. And currently what we're doing from January 15th, um, the program that you might have responded to in the LinkedIn message um, till March 18th, is implementing the phase two multi-site study. So we were focused on the US, but if you know we have interest in Africa in terms of implementing this, this research protocol to see how we can really deliver better care to these infants, as well as you know, if you can help feed pumped milk and donor milk and an HIV positive mother that doesn't have access to this type of therapy that's really important so that the baby gets the safest nutrition and the safest delivery speed of the milk. And so this, so you know how it impacts the mom themselves. Um, these are more of the stats here. It's 88, 66% um, less colic. So more feeding confidence, less pain with biting. 100% of moms recommended that this is making their feeding journey easier as well. And so um, I'm really excited for this study uh, because basically what we're doing right now is giving students who are interested in going through our program or healthcare providers, perhaps like yourself, the opportunity for three things, um, actually four. So if you come through the program and you're able to take our protocol that is very minimal lift, what I mean by that is there's actually no human subjects enrollment the way that it was designed because the protocol asked the hospital's institutional review board to just say, hey, look, why don't you look under the hood? Look at this hospital in LA 
And this is what they found was correlated with their current bottles and their feeding related events and what it was costing the baby's health as well as their disposables budget. And then they were incentivized to just look and see what was going on. But with phase two, what we're empowering our um, clinical leadership um, and innovation advocates to do is take 30 of our samples for the preemie product and for the birth to two month flow and actually say, and if you want to do a prospective study beyond the non-inferiority study, we're going to give you the opportunity to see how this changes or makes a difference in your patient population. And so um, this program specifically to empower clinical leaders is designed to really give a couple of things. One, you can get the opportunity for a publication, right? Like this was a top tier medical journal that we were published in. The, the second is, you know, perhaps, and this is where a lot of the interest has been coming to me in the US from clinicians is like, how did you take this idea and actually get it funded and actually drive it through and turn it into a product that's now being implemented in protocols. And so I'm going to teach the very specific framework that I got from the global leader of uh, scientific research, the same grants that fund NASA, but I've adapted it to also include things from my PhD program, such as design measurement and analysis, which are so critical to actually make sure that you're measuring what matters and that your intervention that you want to test or the therapeutic that you want to test in your setting has enough rigor and actually gets the value alignment of the of the industry adopter so you can actually see it get taken up into practice and and this is translational medicine 101 this is in 9 weeks how we can go from following protocol to resetting protocol, as well as maybe you've had an idea that you want to create. So uh, we're actually raising money now from corporate sponsors to be able to provide an innovation grant in partnership with our um, nonprofit partner, Free Free. And their work is really focused on <clears throat> freedom of women all around the world to be be able to, to recognize signs of abuse, become emotionally free. And then our curriculum with uh, this program is giving you the tools to be financially free as an entrepreneur or as a clinical leader. Um, so at the end of the nine weeks, we're also uh, considering any students who have gone through the program for a continued role with our, our Buy Nurture Labs program. Um, the third opportunity is, you know, perhaps you decide that you actually want to role in clinical leadership in a larger global organization. So we're, we're presenting those opportunities to our students who participate in this program as well. Um, and we'll know by what we're going to announce on uh, January 1st, who those corporations are. So I leave that for any questions that you might have. Again, Bungwe, I thank you so much for joining. It's so late where you are. Yeah, well, thank you, Lauren. So uh, you, you are saying that you want to extend and also uh, maybe thinking of um, collecting data, having um, students or healthcare providers collecting data even here in Southern Africa. So what kind of setting uh, are you looking for to collect data? Is it, uh, I know that your target could be uh, collecting data from high volume, yes. Mm -hmm. Facilities, especially hospitals with genital care, is it uh, facilities with neonatal care uh, departments? Can you repeat the the last question? I didn't quite understand. Oh, okay. So um, are you looking uh, to collect data in Southern Africa, especially in, in, 
in high value facilities within neonatal care uh, departments? Yeah, it would absolutely work um, in this setting. It's it's interesting for us as well because, um, you know, we might find personally as a company, we're focused on really scaling in the United States, but I would be open to including multi-site into Southern Africa because, you know, we might find that it's um, much easier to solve the problem and deliver the solution there as well. So when I okay. say, when you get these slides, I'm going to go ahead and email them to you. Um, okay. Go ahead and take a look through this research publication, which is hyperlinked. You can see the exact uh, methods, inclusion criteria, and basically what we're looking at, just so it's plug and play for the facility that you are working with or you are associated with, is that they are already documenting these elements in their electronic medical record. And so it should be very easy to do. You just get the non-human subjects IRB approval. For us, it worked really well to, to um, make that relationship and the structure of your organizations might differ, but we have a clinical education leader that actually came to uh, me and asked me to present on nursing innovation. And so she had a real interest in making sure that the hospital was doing their best to improve patient health outcomes. And so it was actually a very fast retrospective analysis, looking back at everything that had been documented on current bottles and feeding related events. And that's a very minimal lift study. And if you need statistician support, you know, at the end of the program in March 18th, we can provide the statistical analysis support. Um, and then moving forward, <clears throat> it would be very easy to switch them over and say, okay, now here's the natural nipple product. We're focusing on giving 30 samples for hospitals in the US. If you need more, we can have a further discussion about if we can um, support that from the type of uh, grants that we're receiving. Oh, okay, thanks, Lauren. Yeah, because I'm thinking that if uh, you were to also collect data in Southern Africa, I think um, maybe there would be need to also have uh, the mothers use the natural nipples. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so that they, they share experience on what they've used, not just the ordinary nipples, portly feeding nipples that are currently available, but then also to provide uh, feedback on the, on the natural nipples that um, the study is, is on about, yeah. I agree. So, additionally, um, what I didn't run through today is we do have our own like we've done our own qualitative uh, research with type form. So once the baby is discharged, we are actually um, sending the mom home with a survey to, to really get into exactly like you said, the human experience. You know, you know, if you were using other products before, how do you feel it impacted your latching time, your to breast and to bottle your latching frustration. So that's usually influenced by how fussy the baby is. Um, that's, that's usually the symptom that moms are picking up on when the baby is suffering from colic. And as you know, colic is often caused from these really unnaturally fast flows. So, um, and then we will leave as well, you know, open ended feedback to just hear and I would be curious as well to do some like video interviews if the mom was open. This is what I did in Nepal. And I found Nepal's research very enriching, uh, Bangui, because the difference was, if I can just share really quickly, because we're about to wrap up, I met with the president of their breastfeeding forum, and his job is to report all of their data as a nation to the World Health Organization. And so I was thinking I was going to meet this doctor that is so proud of his country 
for basically how he has gotten them to succeed at breastfeeding for six months exclusively and then up to two years of age mixed feeding. And he was really tired because the problem that exists in the U.S. is the exact same problem with bottles that exist there. He's just been fighting big industry players that supply hospitals typically with bottle nipples from coming in. And the nurses literally feed the babies in the neonatal unit with this tiny spoon. So this tiny spoon, they're just drop by drop trying to control the flow. And so after a three hour conversation with him, it was very fascinating because we're like, okay, that's not implementable in the US where there's just not enough clinicians per baby. You know, we can't. So you need a device that actually delivers the safest, slowest flow. And so that's what the natural nipple is doing. Um, and then the protective factor that, that was very interesting, you know, going back to other barriers to breastfeeding that we found in the United States is this lack of support piece. And so the difference culturally was the process of matrescence or as anthropologists define the perinatal period, this time transitioning from womb to world is still so revered culturally that your neighbor is going to come over and bring you age one, which is like a very uh, nutrient dense seed that has omega three, six and nine. Um, and for the first month, if you have a partner, you're being brought very nutrient dense meals. You're usually going to your parents' house the next month. And so it's really this culture of support and community that you have access to. Um, and so anyway, we're building some of these other stopgap uh, solutions to, to basically support the entirety of the feeding journey beyond this primary barrier that we saw caused by standard bottles. So um, I think if you have any further questions after you get a chance to read through the study, you have my email. We also have another session coming up. So if after you've read through the study, you have any other questions, I'd be happy to, to chat with you so we can hopefully get this implemented in Southern Africa by January 15th. Oh, okay, thank you so much, Lauren, for the presentation. I will uh, look at the slides as soon as you share them with me, and I'll get back to you uh, with questions that I will have. Well, thank you so much. I think, well, I know with my experience as a mom, so I'm a mom, mom of two uh, girls. One is... Uh, six and a half, the other one is, is five. Actually, they are 18 months apart. So with the first one, it was so challenging to breastfeed, especially with the within the first week, that is with latching. But then uh, with the second one, it was much better. I was kind of used. It, it was, I was able to, to tolerate, um, especially the pain and also, I think I, I was able to find my way in terms of how to attach the baby and also how to uh, support the baby or position the baby into the breast and all that. And also, uh, I think experience is the best teacher. But I know the challenge when back to to get a three months maternity leave. So yeah. from there, you should be able, I know uh, for some uh, work environments, it's not possible uh, to express. Uh, and also for other work environments, it is possible, but then it is kind of cumbersome yeah. so to express at work and also. And then yet at that period, you're trying to, to have... Um, a continuity with uh, breast milk feeding. So when you try to express and put in the portly and well, the baby doesn't want, they, 
anyways, for my girls, they really didn't want to feed from the bottle at all. So I had that frustration and I ended up using an open bottle uh, without a nipple. So I think, yeah, the study will really go a long way for breastfeeding mothers and also for, for the, for especially for the preterm uh, mothers with preterm babies. Yeah, yeah you're, and, and thank you so much, Bongoy, uh, for sharing your experience because you bring me to like a really important point, which, <clears throat> you know, it took five years of research and development to really build this product to be as close to mom's breast shape, feel, and flow as possible. But from listening to all of these barriers to breastfeeding, what we have right now is the opportunity to really solve many more problems that we witnessed. And, <clears throat> and because uh -huh. exactly like you're saying, I'll just give you an idea of our pipeline as a company and then the potential for students who are joining us because in January, we're also starting to build an app. So this really concerned me exactly like you said, like you knew how to get a good lunch, but for a woman in the middle of the night who's so far away from a doctor or access to care or a lactation consultant, how does she get the resources that she needs to be able to understand, okay, maybe football hold is good or, Maybe I need to position the baby this way, or maybe she's really concerned about this infection, mastitis, and if she needs to continue breastfeeding, and is it a medical emergency or is it not? And I just don't think it's fair or safe to leave access to clinical care to Dr. Google that is informed by search engine optimization. True. Especially to women who I'm sure have very limited access to healthcare where you're living. And I am building basically a pediatrician in your pocket. So by basically training an AI, what's going to come soon, it won't be this year, um, is the app that instead of relying on Dr. Google, you're actually getting triaged from an AI that has a clinician's brain power. And then if it determines that you need an in-person visit, it's going to recommend you that, or it can pair you with a telehealth visit so that you have access to care at all times if you have Wi-Fi and if you have a cell phone. That's one of the very many innovations that we intend to develop with By Nurture Studios. And so when I mentioned the opportunities at the end of graduation here, um, which would be March 18th. So some of the selected ideas are going to get innovation grants. And so if you've really identified product market fit, and maybe you're like, I want to get vaginal swabs made. We don't have any vaginal swabs to do the, the seeding that I talked about. If you have a cesarean delivery, we need to manufacture these and we need to distribute these in Africa. So that's the type of opportunity to go off and be a spin out and get an innovation grant, get some traction, and then potentially come back and get more funding because we're bringing, you know, U.S. and European capital basically to support women led and nurse led innovations. Um, so that's just an idea of, of the roadmap. It all it really just starts with this phase two study and going through the, the entrepreneurship program. So you feel really equipped and um i would be happy to answer any other questions you have in the next session or if you want to email me after reading the study